Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Amir Sandhu and I'm a senior lecturer in cardiovascular and exercise physiology at Bangor University in the UK. Now in part two of this special three-part strength and conditioning uh, series of videos, we're going to talk about the best exercises that you can use to increase your muscle strength. So let's get straight into it. Now, the purpose of resistance training, as we all know, is to try and increase hypertrophy, so the size of the muscle, uh, the strength of the muscle, so the ability to generate force to overcome resistance, uh, and, and to generate high amounts of power. So that's to try and reach peak force in the shortest amount uh, possible. And what we try to do in our training is to use a combination of training methods and exercises at different points in the training cycle. Now, we'll talk more about the training cycle in part three of the video. So today Today we're going to focus on the combination of exercises that you can use to, to improve the physiological and neuromuscular changes that happen in the body from resistance training. So we're going to cover um, body weight exercises, uh, machines and free weights, we'll have a discussion about that, weightlifting movements, specifically Olympic weightlifting, uh, ballistic training, plyometrics, eccentric training including accentuated ex uh, eccentric uh, training as well, uh, and kettlebell training. So those are the, uh, the types of exercise that have the most uh, research that's been performed, so it's all going to be evidence-based, scientific, um, and there are other methods that are available and obviously you've got to work with your coach to incorporate those methods but what I'm trying to present today are the ones that have been researched the most uh, and have been shown to be effective in various ways to, to improve strength and power. So the first on uh, the first one to discuss today is body weight exercises. Now, body weight exercises are kind of the kind of like staple of any resistance training program. It's the it's, it's a fantastic way to build your foundations, the bread and butter, as it's called. Uh, when I was younger, my older brother was telling me to do press ups, sit ups, pull ups, uh, and all of those body weight type of exercises, and they really help you in those initial training stages to to feel your body, to get that proprioceptive sense. Uh, of the tension going through your muscles uh, and you start to develop some you know initial strength and power so you can uh, power is actually developed by doing the same type of movements that we've got here but with more speed so you try and increase that contractile velocity uh, and that will help to develop uh, power now the limitations of body weight exercises are that it's very hard to get progressive overload. So you know when you're a beginner, you'll start off and you know 10 press ups might be difficult. But eventually you'll progress to 20 and then to 30. Um, but there will come a point where you st will start to increase your reps but that won't translate into increased strength gains. It will start to transfer into endurance gains. So that's something to keep uh, in mind. Now you can use calisthenic vests like this uh, uh, person here, and there are other ways you can include therabands as well to try and increase that resistance, but you will reach a ceiling point. Uh, and that, in, in that respect, you then need to move on to other types of resistance exercises. So it's always something to keep in mind that the, the gains in strength are going to be within a certain and window off reps but as soon as you start doing like 50 or 60 press ups uh, then you're going to start to have endurance adaptations happening in the muscle and not the strength adaptation so that's something to keep in mind now anybody who's anybody that's ever been into a gym will have seen resistance machines and will have used resistance machines again resistance machines are good if you're if you're in the early stages of your training because they help to isolate specific muscle groups so you know you can focus on the chest and the specific parts of the shoulder and the legs etc and they do help to develop strength and power okay so uh, the reason why I say that they're very good for beginners is because they don't require so much coordination as compared to, for example, doing a squat or a deadlift, which will require a lot more coordination. Uh, they don't require stabilizer muscles as well because the machine does uh, the stabilizing for you. So if we take, for example, the classic pec deck, uh, so you know, you, you, you're literally holding onto the handles, uh, the machine is nice and stable, uh, it's only going to move in one direction, so you're going to kind of uh, um, pull the uh, uh, the handles inwards and then pull it out. Now that is okay if you're a beginner or you're recovering from injury. So you know if you are, if you've had an injury and you want to get back into, um, you know, developing some tone and some strength into the muscle, then these resistance machines are fantastic in that setting. However, 
and the other point before I move on to the final point is that they do allow progressive overload because you know you can increase the weight on the stack so there is quite a good uh, flexibility in terms of uh, increasing the overload um, but and this is a very important point when you when you have muscle when you have exercises that are doing the coordination and stabilization for you okay then the application of that movement to a sporting situation is reduced so therefore in in the what i've got this in the context here is that the specificity and the transference to an actual skill is very limited and, and what we've got here is a picture of Jonathan Edwards who is the triple jump world record holder he set that back in 1995 and the record still stands today in 2020 uh, now Jonathan Edwards was actually undergoing a strength training program uh, with his physio physiotherapist Norman Anderson um, and one of the things that he would be doing to perform strength and power with such a complex movement would be using more free weights okay uh, and using uh, uh, exercises which require coordination muscle coordination and stabilize stabilizer muscles being involved as well so that's very important if you're an athlete then you use resistance machines for a certain up to a certain point or in a certain point of your training cycle perhaps at the beginning um, but you when you're thinking about actually the application of your strength and the application of um, uh, you know the power then you need to start thinking about other exercises and there is none better than using free weights okay so anybody that's been to a gym will have also encountered free weights so uh, the, the good thing with free weights is that they often you know if you're doing the the, the kind of uh, bread and butter exercises we're talking about squats deadlifts bench press military press the multi-joint exercises now for the squats the squats use approximately 200 individual muscles in your body so it's a total total kind of hit to all of the muscles in your body it's a very complex movement uh, so if we're, we're seeing this uh, uh, athlete here who's doing the front squat now that requires considerable coordination of all of the muscles in the body to be able to to kind of move that weight okay um, and so what that means is that coordination that you develop in the gym will be applicable when you're in a sporting situation so you know a tennis player returning uh, you know a very heavy uh, sorry a very powerful serve or performing a very powerful serve you know will be able to transfer that kind of skill that he uh, is applying in his sport from the training okay uh, and here we have the Wales rugby team um, again uh, for, this is about application of force so you're not just um, you know training in the gym for no particular purpose you're training so that the, the, the training matches what you're actually going to be doing uh, out in the field the other good thing about free weights is they allow you really in great depth to develop proprioceptive senses okay so they allow you to feel the weight feel the movement feel individual muscles in the body uh, and that includes developing that coordination okay and as soon as you get that coordination you get application so we've talked about the fact that it's applicable to uh, many sporting situations the good thing with free weights is that there's you know for a given exercise you can vary the technique of the exercise so how you perform that exercise as long as it's safe um, you're not doing something that's dangerous you're working with your coach or instructor um, then you you know there's different different variations that you can do you've got much more scope to to vary the exercises now one of the best ways to increase strength, to increase power, is to use specific weightlifting movements. Okay. Now, generally, the research, research studies that I've shown and I've linked to here, presented to here, which I've got the references to, references to in the discussion. Uh, sorry, in the description below. Um, Olympic weightlifting, they often have uh, the greatest increases in strength and power. And the reason is because these movements like the clean and jerk, the snatch, and any other type of weightlifting movement is moved ballistically very quickly with a lot of power. Uh, so you're developing a lot of force over a very short time period. And that has very um, profound adaptations occurring in the body. Now, what we know is that once you do have this kind of moderate heavy weight moved ballistically, you're going to get neuromuscular changes that are 
happening uh, inside uh, within the muscle. Okay, um, so we talked about in first part rate coding. So the frequency of the stimulation of the motor unit. So the, how many times those motor units are activated or activating the the, the muscle fibers is increased. Okay, that's that kind of uh, frequency summation is increased. There's also a greater recruitment of type two motor units from all of the different uh, muscles that are being activated from this very coordinated movement. So it's extremely important uh, when you're thinking about developing uh, strength and power to consider the ballistic nature of Olympic weightlifting and, and performing Olympic weightlifting type moves. Now, if you're a coach, one of the things that uh, you can actually do is emphasize the pulling phase in the training, okay? Because the research studies, again, two that I've uh, list listed here, Shahomel and Comfort, uh, 2015 and 2011 respectively, um, have published some uh, uh, studies that have shown that the pulling movement, so we're talking about the snatch clean mid thigh pull or the jump shrug, uh, they offer the greatest increase in strength or power or rate of force development, for another word, when you compare it to catch movements, okay? Um, now, what that means for the coach is that they can actually prescribe in the pulling phase uh, loads that are greater than the one repetition max for the pull phase, okay? And that's going to increase, in a, in a training uh, situation, that's going to increase uh, your strength gains, which is going to allow better application uh, in competition sporting environment. So that's something to keep in mind when, when you're training, is that, you know, at some points of your training cycle, you can focus on the pulling phase, pulling movements. Now, ballistic training is, the whole purpose of ballistic training is to improve contractile velocity. In other words, speed, okay? The, the, the rate at which you develop your peak force. So that's the brilliant uh, um, uh, kind of advantage of doing uh, ballistic training. Because what, what research studies have actually shown is that where the concentric contraction speed, so this is the shortening speed of the muscle, is accelerated for a very large window of that movement, so 96% of the movement. So let me give you an example here. So let's say, for example, you go to the gym, you do a bench press, you lift up the weight from the bar, you, you're gonna lower it down first, and then you have, to, you have to have a deceleration phase where you're gonna slow it as it gets to your chest, okay? Then what's gonna happen is as you, as you have the concentric contraction and you push back up again, you'll push, but you need to slow the bar again as it gets towards the top. Now with ballistic training, you can do the same movement, but you won't have the deceleration phase. So, you know, what you could actually do is, as, as the, if the bar is lower, you can actually push. So you could do this on the Smith machine, and we'll talk through some examples on the next slide, but you're, you're pushing ballistically the, uh, the bar away from you. And you can do this with a ball, you know, if you have a medicine ball and a partner throws it to you really fast, you can take the ball and you've got the eccentric phase and then a concentric phase and it's all very powerful. So ballistic training has that advantage that you get this muscle shortening um, speed happening for up to 96% of that range of motion, okay? Um, even if you have high training loads, so greater than 60% of one repetition max, you're going to get the, the benefits of this type of training. Now, the adaptations that occur from ballistic training is increased force production, unsurprisingly because you're using the muscle or the contractile part of the muscle over a much greater uh, range, so you're going to have increased force production, greater activation of the muscle, and very and enhanced uh, explosive power, and that's going to be brought about from neuromuscular adaptations. Okay, so you're going to have the threshold for motor unit recruitment, particularly of the type 2 fibers, lower. Okay, so that basically means that you're going to have increased recruitment of those t uh, motor units of that activate type 2 muscle fibers, which equals more force. Um, you're also going to have faster activation. So again, this is we can relate this back to rate coding, frequency summation, faster activation of the motor neuron pool. Okay, so you're, you're improving your electrical circuitry so that you can develop this ballistic uh, power and, and speed. So some examples that you can actually do, one of the classic ballistic training methods is to do the uh, jump squat or also known as the counter movement jump and you know you can see from this figure here that you would uh, slightly lower yourself and then you would really go for a forceful 
uh, force for jump, concentric contraction, um, and that's going to that's going to uh, that that's been shown to improve um, strength, vertical jump height, and translates into many uh, different uh, performance indices that improve when doing this type of uh, movement. Um, I mentioned in the previous slide about the, the bench throw, so again, to do it safely, you could use a Smith machine, um, so you can literally throw that bar into space, and you've got no deceleration phase at all, uh, and that's going to have a very positive impact on your upper body uh, in terms of the ballistic strength that's, that's developed. Now, plyometrics is also a form of uh, ballistic training. We are going to talk about plyometrics towards the end of this uh, um, presentation, but pl plyometric movements are ballistic in nature. So again, you get those same neuromuscular adaptations that are taking, taking place. But by far the most effective ballistic training uh, approach that you can take is Olympic weightlifting. Okay, so Olympic weightlifting, uh, mo many of the movements are ballistic by nature, and they involve moving very large uh, amounts of uh, weight. So you get very quick training adaptations taking place with with Olympic weightlifting. So let's look at it in a slightly a little bit more detail in terms of power. So here we've got Olympic lifting. Um, so we've got you know a, a pull phase being shown in the, in the figure there, and then we've got a powerlifting uh, um, kind of um, example as well. So with powerlifting type exercises, you know you have your back squat, you've got your deadlifts, and your bench press as well as the deadlift that's been shown in the picture here. Now what was shown by a very uh, a pivotal research paper published way back in 1993 by Garhammer, um, he his uh, team his research actually showed that. Due to the fact that most of the movement in Olympic weightlifting, particularly the pool phase, is going to involve rapid acceleration, because that, that, that window of rapid acceleration is so large, that's going to lead to increased amounts of power generation. So we're talking about wattage here. So power is measured in watts. And we're talking about 52 watts per kilogram of body weight of power produced by Olympic weightlifters. So this was a, a study comparing Olympic weightlifters with powerlifters um, that were you know, uh, uh, very similar. So then we look at the data for powerlifters. Now with powerlifting, you're going to be lifting large amounts of load, but it's not ballistic. It's being lifted at slower, uh, slower contractile velocity the contraction is much more uh, uh, sustained and slower. Now, it's very important that we're talking about power here, not necessarily strength, okay? So, what we can see with power lifters is that they produce much lower amounts of power, so it's 12 watt per kilogram of body weight. Uh, so it's obviously, you know, you can see that there's a large difference between these two uh, disciplines uh, for power. So if your sport involves developing, uh, you know, power, so sudden changes in direction, uh, jumping, uh, throwing powerful punches, sprinting, uh, and other types of complex movements that require, um, you know, d developing force in a very short period of time, then it's, you know, the, certainly the research evidence shows that you should incorporate elements of Olympic lifting and ballistic training into your training program. Now, plyometric training um, is, as I said before, a form of ballistic exercise, and what it does is it uses what we call the stretch shortening cycle uh, of an eccentric muscle action. So an eccentric muscle action is when the muscle lengthens under tension. So if I was holding uh, some dumbbells now and I lower them, then the eccentric phase is actually the lowering. So the muscle is still under tension and it's lengthening whilst it's under tension. Conversely, the, con the concentric part is the when I bring the weight back up, so the muscle is actually shortening. Okay, so it, the plyometric training is, is actually is actually utilizing the stretch shortening cycle to try to get adaptations uh, in terms of strength. Now, ply research has shown very recently actually that plyometrics can be just as effective as weightlifting for improving jump height okay so again it's one of those uh, training um, uh, methodologies that you need to work with your coach and employ at certain points uh, of your training program so you know you need to do a needs analysis of your sport do you need to incorporate plyometric training when do you need to inc incorporate do you need to incorporate it in pre-season before competition um, you know so or whilst you're taping 
tapering, etc. So you need to discuss those type of um, um, goals and kind of outcomes with your coach and then decide when you need to incorporate plyometric training. You wouldn't be doing plyometric training all the time. Now, it does have some limitations because it does re rely upon body weight limits. Um, so, you know, you, you, you do, it, you, you reach a ceiling in terms of the progression in, with, with overload. Now again, you can wear calisthenic vests um, and you know you can add weights, uh, light weights as well to try and increase that resistance. The problem with adding weights is that what you do is you increase that time for the stretch shortening cycle. Okay, and the whole point of the plyometrics is to try and uh, maximize that stretch shortening cycle. So by adding weight, you increase that time, you don't get as enough training stimulus and there's also an increased risk of having an injury as well when you're adding weights because you know plyometrics often involve um, quite sudden impact as you land from jumps etc and so there is a greater risk of injury and this is why it's very important that you, you're working with your coach to uh, to know when to use this at the right time because the, the last thing that you need before competition is uh, an injury or a niggle which is going to affect uh, your, your performance and undo all of the other hard work that you've done. Now there is another method um, of uh, uh, strength training which is quite common so it's known as eccentric training um, it's known in gym circles as negatives so you've probably heard of this term uh, being used in the gym so it's basically as I said in the previous slide lengthening the muscle under load um, now the, the old approach or the traditional approach um, which is still valid today of course um, but it does have some limitations is that the what you try to do is you length you do an eccentric contraction very slowly so you know you, you would lower a, um, you know a bar from a biceps curl as slow as you possibly can um, and the, the idea is that it increases time under tension okay However, the only problem with doing that approach is that it does, you know, you, quite, quite often progression is, is limited with that. You know, you, you, you're using either a low weight or the same weight and you, you kind of reach a, 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 almost like a, a plateau and you can't really overcome that plateau. Now, more recently, it's a contemporary method has been suggested and that's accentuated eccentric loading or AEL. Now, what you do in this um, type of training is that you, you increase the load in the eccentric phase uh, but you actually decrease the load in a concentric phase so if we've got the example here what you can see here is a bench press movement and you've got spotters here so quite often for AEL it is handy to have spotters so the spotters will actually push down at certain points of the movement so as that bar is coming down the spotters will push down and increase the resistance that will increase that eccentric load then as the, 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 the individual is pushing that bar back up again, they will, they will help with the concentric phase. So, you know, they'll help lift the bar up. And you can, there's lots of different exercises where you can do these types of uh, uh, increased loading during the eccentric phase. Um, I've put a link into the description of, uh, underneath this video uh, of a, a website which has got lots of different um, exercises that you can use to incorporate into your training that, that actually use this method. Okay. Uh, for the whole body so that's worth actually looking at in terms of the science the scientific studies that have been done show that AEL increases the proliferation of satellite cells um, and we know that satellite cells are involved that they're, they're present on all of our muscle fibers and they are the ones that provide the genetic instructions for a muscle fiber to divide uh, and for the muscle to get larger okay myofibrillar hypertrophy so it's a very good way to to increase uh, the proliferation of satellite cells now one thing that's important is eccentric training by its very nature is what causes the um, stimulus for muscle growth so you know whether you're doing eccentric training or not any other type of weightlifting movement is going to have an eccentric phase involved in it then it's the eccentric phase that causes the delayed onset muscle soreness the pain that you get a couple of days later because that pain is actually um, the, the inflammation the, the re repair process that's happening myofibrillar hypertrophy and the muscle growing and becoming stronger so you know it's not surprising that you know when you're when you emphasize the eccentric part for resistance training program you're going to get um, you know several adaptations taking place we you know we've talked about the increase in uh, the morphological changes in terms of muscle cross-sectional area but you know your tendon cross-sectional area will change um, you have those neuromuscular adaptations that occur you know with pretty much most resistance training methods uh, quicker recruitment of of, uh, the motor units a higher firing rate of the motor units um, 
you have an improvement in your mechanical function. I'm not going through these in order. I'm talking um, about the, the changes that occur first physiologically and, and in the neuromuscular system, then the increase in strength, power and stiffness, and that translating into performance improvements uh, in terms of your speed, spring speed, jump height, um, and even agility. So those ch ch sudden changes in direction. Um, and last but not least, kettlebell training uh, is something that's been used quite often uh, when you go to most, uh, most gyms, you'll see a kettlebell area. So kettlebells are, are actually quite good because you can do, a, they're quite versatile. You'll do lifting, swinging, lots of different variations of weightlifting movements as well. You can use them at home. Um, you know, they don't take up that much space. They do have limitations though. And one of the key ones, the first one here is, it's very difficult to, to perform overload. Now, you do get heavier kettlebells, but one thing that people that use regularly use kettlebells will tell you that gripping larger kettlebells is very difficult. So it becomes harder the heavier that kettlebell is. And of course, if you're swinging that about, then there is a potential risk of injury as well. In terms of the scientific studies, the findings about kettlebell training are mixed. Okay, um, so some studies do show that it has beneficial uh, effect on performance variables uh, and others show that it doesn't have any effect at all. What I would suggest if you're an athlete or a coach um, and you know, you're, you're, you're incorporating kettlebell training is to think about using them at specific stages of your training program when you want to develop speed and when you want to develop some strength as well. Because you can move these at high velocity, you know, because you can move kettlebells of moderate weight at, at, you know, ballistically, they will be good for speed generation and you, know, you can try and mimic movements that might match your sport. So they are worth considering um, in, in your sport. And of course, if they help you and you feel that there's some tangible benefit, then it's definitely something that you should consider in your training program. So hopefully what we've seen in today's presentation presentation is, is a selection of different exercises that you can use at various points of your training cycle. They've all got um, sci a scientific basis. They've all got physiological and neuromuscular adaptations. By far, Olympic weightlifting and ballistic training appear to be <clears throat> excuse me, the, the most effective in developing uh, strength uh, in, ter in, in terms of developing power and the rate of force development. Um, but of course, you, know, you need to work with your coach and really carefully consider when you're going to use these different training methodologies in your training cycle. So that is the end of part two. In part three, what we're going to do is look at the uh, concept of periodization. And this is the, the idea that you can develop your training plan so that you reach peak performance just before you, you go towards competition. So that's it for this part. I'll hopefully see you again very soon.